there be peace. I am a stand for peace. Let there be love. I am a stand for love. Let there be joy. I am a stand for joy. We are making a new world now. We are making a new world now. We are making a new Good morning again, everyone. We want to welcome those of you who are with us on Zoom this morning and also those who have tuned in for our live stream on Facebook. It is a glorious day and we're going to begin by reading today's daily word. And the words for today are Father's Blessing. This is Sunday, June 19th, 2022. I bless all fathers with thoughts of gratitude. I bless all fathers with thoughts of gratitude. I am grateful for fathers, grandfathers, stepfathers, and all father figures who care for children and families. I pray they are called always to follow their guidance and to act to express divine love. I envision their hearts and minds open to receive blessings of strength, patience, and tenderness. I see them supported in all they are called upon to do and comforted during times of struggle. I pray also for children, young and old, as they remember their fathers. May cherished memories bring smiles and warmth, and may the love remain alive forever in hearts and minds. And for all those on a healing or forgiveness journey, I pray that divine love leads and comforts them on a path toward lasting peace. May the peace and love of God fill their hearts today and every day. And our scripture today is from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. And again, happy Father's Day, one and all. Now I would like to introduce Harold Payne in a more correct fashion than we have so far managed this morning. He is a renowned musician. His songs have been on many multi-platinum albums. He's won awards from the Posse Music Fest. He has been with us before, and obviously we really enjoyed his presence because we asked him back. And we're honored to have you with us today, Harold, and we ask that you, that you share what's going on with you now and how can we partake of it. It's this Harold Payne. Well, thank you for that introduction, and since you've asked me to, uh, um, I have a website, haroldpainmusic.com, and I do uh, a, a regular Facebook Live called Tucson Tuesday at 5.30 on my Harold Payne uh, on Facebook. And, um, and I'm playing constantly, doing custom songs and improv and making up songs on the spot for doing recap improv and etc. And I always enjoy being in your presence. So. Um, Thank you for having me. And uh, right now, um, I believe it's time to do a sing-along here, which is a little bit different when we're uh, online here, but uh, we're gonna do it anyway. This song I wrote with Karen Drucker. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. You are welcome. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. We are welcome. We are welcome here. We are welcome here. We are welcome here. Yes, we are. We are welcome here. We are welcome here. We are welcome here. I am welcome. I am. Um 
arms are wide open There's room for everyone Wherever we're going Wherever you're from You are home You are welcome here You are welcome here You are welcome here We are welcome We are welcome we are welcome here. We are welcome here. I am welcome. I am welcome here. I am welcome here. I am welcome here. Whatever you've been through, you found us somehow. Wherever you are. This morning we are doing a part three of our featurette on Turkey. And this part is about Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He lived from 1881 to 1938. He came into the public awareness as a war hero in World War I, specifically in the Battle of Gallipoli, where he defended Turkey, which was still ruled by the Ottomans. You remember when we talked about uh, Sophia, Hag uh, Hagia Sophia, and said that it had been a Christian church until the Ottomans conquered Constantinople in 1453? Well, here we were, 1919, and they were still in charge of things. So he defended his country, and then after the war, he had to defend Turkey from being divided by the Allied forces. You know how they went in and divided several countries after the war. And he managed to get troops to stop that as part of the Turkey War for Independence. Then he went on and ousted the Ottomans, and he founded the Republic of Turkey. This is for the first time in history. If you ever want to study Turkish history, good luck. You, know, you have to begin 2,500 years ago. There is a lot that happened. Hell, I, I just started here, World War I. Ataturk served as president from 1923 until his death in 1938. He wanted a homogenized Turkey. Turkey was an assortment of different countries, different regions, different nationalities, different languages, different ethnicities. He initiated a rigorous program of political, economic, and cultural reforms with the ultimate aim of building a modern, progressive, and secular nation state. So part of this, this gets, oh, this gets good. Part of this has to do with the fez. Fez is that hat on the right. It was the successor to the turban. And the turban is shown uh, on the man on the left. At one time, the turban was worn by all of the Turks and it became a symbol, one thing of them being religious, but another thing almost like a caricature. And the turbans were outlawed by the Ottomans in 1829 and replaced by the fezes. So then over the next, you know, 100 years or so, the fez took on the same problems as the turban had had before and that it became 
almost a caricature of the Turks and symbolized them as a religious nation, which they no longer were. They were a secular nation state. And so in 1925, Ataturk outlawed the turbans. Have you ever lived anywhere where they outlawed two different kinds of hats? Um, one of the things, however, that they did not outlaw was Elizabeth Taylor. She looks darn good in a turban. And that's just a joke, but nobody would ever outlaw Elizabeth Taylor. Part of the reforms of Ataturk was to have an alphabet created for the Turkish language. They had had, a, they'd relied primarily on the Arabian script and it was a language that was written one thing from right to left instead of left to right and in characters that were not recognizable by the Western world. So Ataturk got together a group of linguists and insisted that the Latin alphabet be used, which linked Turkey to the West thereafter. The Turkish alphabet has 29 letters, but they left out Q and W and X. They didn't have any need for them. However, they do have eight vowels, and we only have five. So if you look at these letters, you'll see that there's two O's. One's got the uh, little dots above it. And there's two I's, and one of them has a dot, and one does not. There's two U's, one's got the dots, and a couple of other letters are duplicates. These are called diacritics the little uh, glyphs that are attached either above or below letters to make differentiations in, in the way that they're pronounced. Now, when this alphabet was implemented, that meant that 100% of the Turks were illiterate. They all had to learn to read again. And they had to learn what their language now looked like in this alphabet, and there were new words for things. And, and they just had to give up the fez. I think that these people had PTSD, I really do. They were like knocked around and gave up this and had to learn that and became illiterate and they couldn't wear their hats anymore and it, and it went on from there. This is an example of a computer keyboard with the Turkish alphabet on it. And when you look at it, you'll see right here is the I with a dot. And here in the place where I is on most keyboards is the I without the dot. When I was in Turkey, our tour group stayed at a hotel that had a business center. And a lot of the members of the tour group went to, to send emails and, and the emails kept on not, not going through. And it was because they were using the eye where they were used to seeing it. But really they needed the eye with the dot and they needed to be using this key. There are other letters that might have been a problem also, but the eye was the one that got them. Another part of what was called turfification was requiring surnames. They passed the surname law in 1934, and there were guidelines as to what last names, what surnames the Turks could choose. They had to be Turkish surnames, regardless of the ethnicity of the people. They, they had to, it couldn't be silly. They had to either reflect what you did for a living or, or some noble concept. They were given a deadline and told that if the head of the family did not choose a surname for his family, then it would be assigned by this certain deadline. This is when Ataturk became Ataturk's last name, Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, and the word Ataturk means the father of the Turks. During his leadership, Ataturk had 
thousands of schools built. He made primary education mandatory and free and included girls. He was a supporter of women's rights. And this slide shows 18 females who joined the Turkish parliament in the 1935 general elections. I'm getting goosebumps. And in 1993, Tansu Chiller became Turkey's first female prime minister. Turkey was ahead of the times. They were ahead of many European countries and many of the states in the United States in giving women's rights and the right to vote and the right to hold national office. Then Ataturk died in 1938 and this is his mausoleum in Ankara. It's huge. It goes underground too. You could spend more than a day touring the whole thing. He had always been a heavy smoker and a heavy drinker. He died of cirrhosis of the liver. And sometimes our heroes are loved even more because of the weaknesses that show they are human and that applied to him. If you go to Turkey, you will fall in love with Ataturk. It is guaranteed. The current leader of Turkey is, you know, I practice all these names, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. That beautiful picture with these slides. He is president of the Republic of Turkey, which is their country. This is how they spell their country, the name of their country. His wife, the first lady, her name is Emini. And I think she's so beautiful. She also uh, wears a more conservative headdress than is common in Turkey. As a general rule, women in Turkey wear clothes similar to European women, but a little on the modest side. And even the Turkish religious women do not follow a strict dress code like in most Islamic countries. They wear loose clothing and head scarves while still being stylish and, and colorful. And here is the first couple, the president and the first lady. Erdogan was the mayor of Istanbul from 1994 to 1998. So you can assume that he was on his way rising in politics while there was a female prime minister. So he came in when Turkey was becoming really something, really something. Under his leadership, the government changed. It uh, changed from being led by a parliament to being led by a president, a presidential style of government. And he ran for president. So after he served as prime minister from 2003, he became president in 2014, and he still is president. Now, what I read was that presidents hold their terms for five years, and that would mean 2024, his second term was up. And if, if that is true, if my understanding is true, that might be a very exciting year for Turkey and to keep your, your eye on it. There have been criticisms of his leadership, including an attempted coup in 2016. One of the things he is criticized for are some of the sanctions and censorship that he's put on the people, that he's put on the press and the reporters. He's made it illegal to criticize Turkey. And he has, from time to time, banned public access to websites, including commonly used ones like Twitter and Facebook and, and ones that we use every day. I think that one of the easiest ways of understanding the way the world looks at Turkey right now and some of the issues they have is to know what's going on in their trying to become part of the European Union. 
And this slide shows the 27 countries of the European Union. And the prospects of Turkey joining the EU have been dim for a long time. In practice, Ankara has no credible prospect of membership in the near future, if ever. Today, Turkey comes nowhere, no fulfill, nowhere near fulfilling the EU's eligibility rules, which stipulate that candidate countries have institutions that guarantee democracy and the rule of law and human rights, as well as a well-functioning market economy. So I wanted to include information about tourist safety. This is exciting. I just get excited just looking at that. Um, stay tuned. We just might have a tour to Turkey next spring. Yeah, it, would, it could really happen very easily. Turkey is safe to visit if you avoid some parts of it, namely those near the border with Syria. You should be aware that the tourist hot spots like restaurants and shops and public transportation are places where the most thefts and pickpocketing occur and that there is some violent crime also. And we know that no travel is risk-free during the COVID pandemic, but Turkey is relatively safe and open, open for tourism. However, it should be noted that at least this past March, March of 2022, there were high numbers of COVID cases and Omicron cases as that continued to spread around the country. Those are things it would be common sense to check out no matter where you were planning to go. And so then I'm going to close with a list of 14 things to avoid while you are touring Turkey. The first is, don't wear shoes in worship places. Do not forget table etiquette. Avoid obscuring a praying person's view. Do not disrespect Ramadan customs. Do not board a cab without a taxi logo. That means if the car doesn't have a sign on it saying it's a taxi, don't get in it. Do not wear revealing clothes. Do not misuse the Turkish language. The next one's really interesting. Avoid leaving food on your plate. <laughs> Avoid consuming too much alcohol. Avoid directly addressing a Turkish woman in public. Don't mind if people smoke at the dinner table. Don't buy stones or fossils. Don't buy stuff without bargaining. And the most important one at all is don't disrespect Ataturk. And on that note, we will end our feature at. Thank you very much. Here's a little sing along about a repetition. Something wonderful, something wonderful is happening to me right here, right now. Gonna say that again. Something wonderful, something wonderful is happening to me right here, right now. I can feel it in my body. I can feel it in my body. I can feel it in my soul. I can feel it in my heart. I can feel it in my heart. And it won't let go. Right here, right now Something wonderful Something wonderful Oh, oh, something wonderful Is happening to me Right here, right now I can feel it in my body 
my body I can feel it in my soul I can feel it in my heart And it won't let go There's something wonderful Oh, something wonderful Is happening to me Right This love inside, all oh, this love inside, we can't let it shine, we can't let it shine, something wonderful, something wonderful is happening to me right here, right now. Thank you, Harold. That was wonderful. We are going to bring up some information on um, Silent Unity and how you can send your prayer requests. And we'll take a moment to bless the prayer requests that we receive. We receive them when we meet in person. We have a prayer box and uh, prayer slips that you can fill out. We can receive them in uh, email form, or you can call our um, number and have a prayer chaplain contact you. The screen is showing the ways that you can contact Silent Unity. They also have a, an app for the phone called the You Pray app, and I've got to admit it's my favorite way. Now, Lisa used it for years, and I, I kept on using other things, but... She was right. It's really nice. And it's free. And you say your prayer request and they email you an answer. Know that the Unity Movement was founded on prayer. And that prayer has been continuous through Silent Unity for about 150 years. When we pray, we imagine each beloved enfolded in a brilliant inner radiance that dissolves all obstacles and bestows upon them a calm peace. We envision them becoming receptive to their intuitive guidance and empowered to act upon it. And as we release each one into their indwelling power, we affirm they are free to discover and claim wholeness peace and prosperity and so it is amen and amen and so now we prepare for a time of meditation we encourage you to become comfortable today's meditation is based on a course in miracles this is lesson 124 to just allow these words to wash over you and, and probably change you at death. The name of this lesson is, Let Me Remember I Am One with God. Today we give thanks that we are one with God. Our home is safe, protection guaranteed in all we do power and strength available to us in all our undertakings. We can fail in nothing. Everything we touch takes on a shining light that blesses and that heals. At one with God and with the universe, we go our way rejoicing with the thought that God goes everywhere with us. How holy are our minds and everything we see reflects the holiness within the mind at one with God and with itself. 
How easily do errors disappear and death give place to everlasting life. Our shining footprints point the way to truth for God is our companion as we walk the world a little while. And those who come to follow us will recognize the way because the light we carry stays behind, yet still remains with us as we walk on. No miracle can ever be denied to those who know that they are one with God. Every thought of theirs has the power to heal all forms of suffering in anyone in times gone by and times as yet to come. Their thoughts are timeless and apart from distance as apart from time. We take a few moments in the silence as we practice the awareness that we are one with God. And this time will be framed in gold with every moment like a diamond set around the mirror that reflects the Christ's face as your own. Perhaps today, perhaps tomorrow, you will look into this mirror and understand that the sinless light you see belongs to you. The lovingness, the loveliness you look on is your own. You will feel a sense of love you cannot understand, a joy too deep for you to comprehend a sight too holy for the body's eyes to see. And yet you can be sure someday, perhaps today, perhaps tomorrow, you will understand and comprehend and see. Let us remember that we are one with God. Now and forevermore. Amen. will need you to unmute Harold. This is a song I wrote uh, for my father, so in honor of Father's Day and all of our fathers. When I think of everyone who's tried to help me well, it makes me wish that I could find a way to pay them back For all the little acts of kindness That helped me find my way When I was falling from the track But a grateful man's intentions Make him worth his weight in gold If he can pass it to the next man he finds lost out in the cold Pass it on, brother Pass it on If you can't pay it back Pass it on I can't say I'll ever be a rich man And the things that I can call my own I can carry on my back all the helping hands that reached out and found me have left me with a love that lasts through anything I lack. And I'm thinking if I ever make it up that hill someday, you know I won't forget to leave a little bit of love along the way. Pass it on, sister. Pass it on If you can't pay it back Pass it on And I'm thinking
thinking if I ever make it up that hill someday, you know I won't forget to leave a whole lot of love along the way. Pass it on, brother, pass it on. If you can't pay it back, well, if you can't pay it back, if you can't pay it back to the person that gave you what you had in the beginning, there's only one way to keep the circle from being unbroken. You got to pass it on. If you can't pay it back, then by all means, you got to pass it on. Thank you, Harold. All right. Now it's time for our Sunday talk, and the title of today's talk is This Too is from God. And that title is based on this series of affirmations, and they go this way This too is good. This too is from God. This to shall bless me. And that can be applied to, to anything that's challenging you or, or not. It can be applied to illness or relationships or prosperity because a person who knows they're one with God knows that everything is from God and everything is good and everything is a blessing. These ideas reflect a set of base assumptions about the nature of the world and our place in it. They do not agree with many common beliefs and fears, for we live in a world of fear. We believe we can be victims of all sorts of things, of criminals and viruses and accidents and, and random fate. But unity teaches the law of mind action, that thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. When we take unity's teachings to their deepest meaning, we realize we are never victims, that we always choose our experience. Perhaps we're choosing it from the level of our higher selves, because our earthly selves are only the tip of the iceberg, our consciousness engulfs much more than that. Our higher selves are still us. We still have free will. Last week, we discussed developing double vision. Double vision. How we can perceive a world that is dangerous and filled with injustice and suffering while at the same time, we can be aware of the greater truth of creation. And reconciling these two visions may be the path to ascension. Double vision may also be called that blessed ambiguity. How I know in my heart of heart that these things are true and yet there is still a human part of me that acts differently. We are humans. We are born into race consciousness and we inherit a set of beliefs and ideas that form our mass experience. Yet, if we can but recognize that these beliefs are invalid, and if we can hold to a set of principles that more accurately define reality and define divinity and define humanity, then our experience will mirror those beliefs. That is our mission. It is easier said than done. At least from our human viewpoint, it seems like it's easier said than done. 
even amongst true students. This is what people who practice unity <coughs> are called, true students. There seems to be an acceptance of cause and effect that denies our basic principles. We live in times that are intended to expose the opposing ideas that we embrace. I saw something on Facebook yesterday that said we are in the sunset times. That when you're reaching the end of an era, it's like when you reach the end of a day and the sunset is the most brilliant part of the day with the brightest colors and the brightest light from the sun. And in this sunset era, our beliefs are shining more brightly than they have. And they are shining that so that we can recognize them. A Course in Miracles teaches the truth you don't necessarily want to hear. It opens the curtain and exposes the little person behind it disguised as a powerful wizard. A Course in Miracles steadfastly explains the illusion of the world and how to end it. I'm going to read a few excerpts from Lesson 136 in A Course in Miracles. Sickness is a decision. It is not a thing that happens to you quite unsought, which makes you weak and brings you suffering. It is a choice you make, a plan you lay. No one can heal unless he understands what purpose sickness seems to serve. So I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories. This is about Priscilla Richards. She was the head librarian when I was in school and in, in seminary at Unity Village. Priscilla and I are still friends. We're, we're Facebook friends now, and I have her permission to share her story. But after I was ordained, I went on a divine feminine tour of, of France, and Priscilla was one of the, the Unity ladies that was on the tour. And one day she and I were walking down the streets of Paris when she said, you know, I'm 50 years old and I've never had a mammogram. And I really don't know if I should get one or not. It's one of those Unity beliefs that we, we have to practice double vision about. But she decided when she got home to get one and they found a tumor and they said she needed a mastectomy. So she had a few weeks before the surgery was scheduled and she spent that time praying and meditating and, and reading spiritual books. And one night, a few days before the surgery, she couldn't sleep and she got up in the middle of the night and she was praying and she knew without question that the cancer was gone. She knew that she was cured. So then she thought, well, what do I do about this surgery I have scheduled? So she took that into prayer also. And what she received was, you are cured. But if you do not have the surgery, you will not be healed. Interesting. Interesting to think there's a difference between being cured and being healed. So she chose to have the surgery and, and the doctor was supposed to call her with the pathology report afterwards and didn't call for like a couple of weeks. So Priscilla finally called the doctor who said, I, I couldn't call because I, I didn't know what to say because we couldn't find any cancer. And Priscilla said, I know. So she and the doctor talked for over an hour and the doctor, once being introduced to Unity's background in spiritual healing, became active in a breast cancer support group at the Light Center, which was, is still a, a retreat center, a Unity retreat center near Kansas City. I went to see Priscilla at her house when she got home from the hospital and she was a different person. Her face was soft 
She was sweet. Even her hair was softer. And she told me that when she was born, she had an older brother who was a special needs child. And she herself was an unplanned baby. Her brother took all of her parents' time and energy. And she seemed to know from birth that she better not ask for too much. They say she didn't even cry as a baby. And she grew up without having that nurturing until she went to the hospital for the cancer surgery. And the nurses were so good to her, and they babied her, and they, they mothered her. And, and when she got home, her adult daughter came to stay with her during her recovery and took care of her. And for the first time in her life, she was the one that other people took care of. And she said it was like this big empty space got filled. And it changed her forever. It healed her. This was the healing. She, she quit her job at the village and moved to Colorado, Rocky Mountain High, with her daughter. So now notice that based on our old, limited, erroneous ideas, we may think that the doctor should somehow be blamed. It was an unnecessary surgery, as it turned out. Or we may think, Oh, poor Priscilla, she had this unnecessary operation, blah, 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 blah. And yet, there were much more important gifts to be obtained. The doctor started working with a unity group, making an aperture, an opening between Western and Eastern thought when it comes to healing and medicine. Priscilla was able to heal her, her childhood wounds and went on to create a new life for herself. This is an amazing story, all the more so because it's a true story and one I know personally. And with all of this being said, I need to share with you that I have been diagnosed with breast cancer. It's not my first rodeo. I kind of crack up because even the doctors and nurses say to me, this is not your first rodeo. I am scheduled for a lumpectomy and radiation and unless they find more problems, that's probably all I will need. We expect this surgery to be the week of July 4th. When I had breast cancer the first time in 2008, I had no question but that I was going to see a surgeon. I was already a true student. It never crossed my mind to try to heal it through prayer and meditation. But after that, a few years later, I had a, a little skin cancer right here. And I had it biopsied and they said it was a basal cell carcinoma and that they needed to remove it. And I thought, you know, this is very low risk cancer, skin cancer, and I think that I'll, I'll work on it in my hammock, which is where I like to meditate. And I did, there were a few weeks before the surgery was scheduled and it healed. It was no longer a sore. By the time the date for the surgery came, it was a scar, it was just a little dimple, uh, about as big as a BB. And, and I, kind of like Priscilla, I had to decide, was I going to have the surgery? I knew the cancer was gone. And I thought, I'll be telling this story for the rest of my career. And it's going to be a much better story if I have the surgery and the doctor does not find any cancer. So I went, had it removed, they found no cancer. So this time, I, I've got double vision. I am using uh, some of the healing practices we've taught in our church, the medical assistance program. I have my hammock up, and oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's my favorite place in the world. I think that understanding what being cured and what being healed mean is the important part. And I know that this is an opportunity for self-transformation. 
And there can be many different outcomes to this disease, but they will, whatever, be good. And they will, whatever, bless me. I wanted to share a couple of my favorite healing quotes with you. One is, isn't it good that I am now strong enough that this has come up to be healed? And the other one is, for everything that has happened in my life, I am grateful. And for everything that is yet to come, I am willing. So I want to close with one of my favorite little quotes from Pilgrim on Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. This will be new to maybe two of you, but the rest of you will recognize it. It doesn't hurt to hear it against my faith. She wrote, There is always an enormous temptation in all of life to diddle around making itsy-bitsy friends and meals and journeys for itsy-bitsy years on end. The world is wilder than that in all directions, more dangerous and bitter more extravagant and bright. We are making hay when we should be making whoopee. We are raising tomatoes when we should be raising Cain or raising Lazarus. My prayer for all of us is that we do not let the itsy bitsy distractions of life prevent us from beholding and expressing the divine in every experience. And thus ends the lesson. God bless you all. In a world of fear, we can choose our experiences we have the acuity to have a blessed ambiguity. I'm a fearless flyer. I'm a wind rider. I am all I need to be. In the pouring rain of a hurricane, I am flying. of winter blooming in the snow reaching for the sky above from the earth below growing from a tiny seed awakening these dreams believing in the of spring I'm a fearless flyer I'm a wind rider I am all I need to be in the pouring rain of a hurricane I am flying fearlessly standing on a mountain top I take a leap of faith knowing it's a moment that cannot wait rolling with the changing current dancing with the breeze As inspiration carries me where my soul is meant to be. I'm a fearless flyer. I'm a wind rider. I am all I need to be. In the pouring rain of a hurricane, I am flying.
silence Shadows grow long I am the shining sun That rises with the dawn I'm a fearless flyer I'm a wind rider I am all I need to be In the pouring rain Of a hurricane I am flying fearlessly I am flying song thank you Harold so it's time for us to bless our love offering when we meet in person we have the opportunity to pass the bag but when we meet on zoom we make sure you know other ways to send us your donation we have our post office box 2176 in Citrus Heights also, there are donate buttons in our newsletter and our website. You can use PayPal for that. Remember that you are a vital part of this spiritual community. All Unity Churches are self-supporting through their own contributions. We are who we make us. We also support headquarters. We send money to Silent Unity every month. So know that it is through your support that we are able to provide our services, and we thank you. We thank you. You should thank each other. Thank you from all the folks who share our time together. So let us join in blessing the love offerings with Unity's Prosperity Prayer, knowing that divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am all that I have, all that I choose to give, and all that I am open to receive. And so it is. Amen. So we have a few announcements this morning. Uh, this coming Saturday on uh, June the 25th, we are having our summer solstice gathering. It is called Rock of My Solstice. Uh, one of the songs we've done before and we'll do again at our solstice gathering is Rock of My Soul in the Bosom of Abraham. And this is the Rock of My Solstice. We'll, we'll have the Pebbles of Willingness ritual. And we're going to paint rocks with our vision of what our soul's question is for the summer season. And just have uh, some raucous frivolity, raucous frivolity, arf, arf. It's at the home of Bill and Mariana Graff in Citrus Heights. It begins at 7 p.m. You sign up on our website, and then we'll send you their address. We like to protect their privacy. And we are requesting a $15 love offering. So we hope to see you there. There's not going to be any moon that night. We're starting at 7, so that we figure it'll end about 9, and the sun will go down before then. And the graphs have got a fire pit, a very nice fire pit, and we'll have some time at the end when it's dark, and we can do things out in the dark. The next day, which is next Sunday, the Reverend Sheila Ford is our guest speaker. This is at the Sylvan Community Center, and Lisa will be providing music. Sheila is speaking on strength, courage and comfort in difficult times and she's involved in what used to be called the be peace movement it, they, it's got a different name now based in Costa Rica and it's a fascinating organization I'm sure she'll share some things about it when she is with us next Sunday 10 a.m. at the Sylvan Community Center then on Friday, the 1st of July, we're having our first Friday meditation. I'm leading it, and it is at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And that following Sunday, that's two Sundays from now, which is July the 3rd, we'll be doing some uh, Independence Day themes. It's on Zoom and Heart Dream. 
is going to be joining us. Last year, I, I asked him to, to learn uh, the city of New Orleans because to me, it's as good a patriotic song as any of the others, and they did. They did a really good job, so I've asked him to do it again this year. We always enjoy Heart Dream when they're with us. Then today, as always, after this service, we will be ending our recording, and those who are on Zoom with us are invited to stay and chat and have a little time of check-in. It's one of our favorite times of the week, so please do stay if you possibly can. And now we're going to invite Harold to lead us in the peace song. Make sure you're not muted, Harold. Thank you. It starts with weave us together. Weave, weave, weave us together. Weave us together in unity and love. Weave, weave, weave us together. Weave us together in unity and love. And let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me let peace be peace on earth the peace that was meant to be the god as creator family all of we let us walk with each other in perfect Harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my joyful vow. Take each moment and live each moment in peace. Turn a We should have um, the prayer for protection somewhere. I think we're just going to wing it. And please join me in knowing that the light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. And the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Wherever we are, God is. God is. Wherever we are, God is. God is. In citrus heights or Southern Cal We know that God is Wherever we are Wherever we are God is God is Wherever we are You inspired me to do this on my guitar That is what we're here.